Hello, my name's Lucy, and today we're going to be cooking beanie beef and bacon loaded sweet potato wedges with lime soured cream and spring onion. So that's this recipe, uh, and this is a Hello Fresh recipe. It's the last one of my box for this week, um, before I have to wait until it's only it's not long, it's not long now. It's uh, it's already Wednesday this week, and it's Wednesday next week that I get my next box. Uh, but I have other food in the fridge, obviously. Um, and just as a reminder, what I do is um, I cook from beginning to end with uh, no editing cuts, which means you get to see exactly how long everything takes and also listen to me natter on about whatever's in my brain at the moment. I saw a baby bird earlier. You're going to hear a lot about that. Um, there's probably also going to be some poetry reading. I will might talk about theatre as well. It's, 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 it's generally just sort of a chatty time. Um, so we're going to cook this recipe and obviously the first thing you'd do is you'd wash your hands. Um, I've already done that because uh, I was doing the washing up and so that has made my hands nice and clean. Um, and again, for people who are unaware, I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, got any of the equipment out yet because um, I think that's, that's part of uh, cooking. That's part of the time it takes to cook is you go into the kitchen and go, right, I'm going to make something. I need to get out my pots, my pans, my chopping board. Um, they're not just waiting there for you. So I'm going to put the apron on and I'm going to get started. This recipe I'm looking forward to. I've had a similar one, but it was with um, ordinary uh, potato wedges rather than sweet potato wedges. And I do like a sweet potato. So uh, first I'll get the uh, HelloFresh bag of ingredients. And again, I'm not sponsored in any way by HelloFresh. I just buy these and I just like them. And they're sort of mildly expensive for what they are, but. Uh, you're also paying for a bit of convenience generally, so that's sort of that's sort of where I fall on that. Um, I, I, I keep buying them, so I certainly seem to think they're worth the money. So um, the things we need are a sweet potato, a spring onion, that's in the fridge, I'll get in a second, same with the cheddar cheese, some black beans, which come in this nice carton, a lime, some garlic. Um, I think on the back it probably says, uh, let's double check how much garlic it claims it needs. One clove of garlic. Um, I have many cloves of garlic. I probably won't use all of these now, but um, basically the way they do it with garlic is uh, they send you an entire clove for the box. So, um, uh, it's not an entire clove, sorry, an entire bulb. Um, and then you split it between the recipes that need garlic and then you'd have some spare, um, unless you're me and you've had three recipes that involve garlic and you use more garlic than they recommend, in which case you don't. Anyway, uh, beef mince and bacon lardons, they're in the fridge. Mexican spice, comes in a nice little packet. Tomato passata in a tub. And then barbecue sauce and sour cream, uh, they're in the fridge as well. So now I'll get those bits out. So the barbecue sauce, um, I made this myself, there's a video of it, um, a few days ago because um, the one thing that was missing from this entire, and it's an entire box of worth of food, so it had, um, it had three main meals and the garlic, not the garlic bread, the pizza bread snack and, and it's got some chocolate brownies that I haven't made yet um, in it and there was one thing missing and it was the uh, sachet of barbecue sauce, so I made my own, which I've been wanting to sort of vaguely do anyway, just, uh, just as, to see what it was like. Um, so that wasn't too much of a hassle. And if, like with HelloFresh, again, again, I don't work for them, but I will say they've been very good. Um, they didn't used to ever have missing ingredients, basically. And then since the pandemic, I think they've got busier and uh, things have got more stressed on their staff. Um, and then so I've had things occasionally go missing, but not, not like regularly, like maybe once every few months. Um, and if it is a big ingredient, like a piece of chicken or something, then, um, which has only happened like twice, um, I've basically reported it to them and they've just given me a credit off my next box. So they do make it good when it happens and it's very rare. And I haven't bothered with the barbecue sauce because it is like, most people have like, just like a carton of it, like in the fridge anyway, just like a, like, like the bottle of it. And even if you don't, making it's quite quick or you could buy an entire bottle of it for a pound and then have it for later as well. So I basically, um, thought that probably wasn't worth getting a five pound credit for, um, but uh, like if I if I'd made more of a fuss about it, I could have done. Uh, but anyway, uh, so that's the barbecue sauce. I also need the sour cream, the mince, the lardons. I 
I dropped the cheese. Fortunately, it's in the back because my kitchen floor is a bit of a state and I do need to wash it. Right, so uh, that's everything, and I actually have uh, more spring onions than I need because I tend to buy extra spring onions because, again, it's one of the things where they give you, like, a spring onion, and, and it's quite a decently sized one, um, but I like to use a couple. Uh, so I will... And then they go well in other things, like things that I cook for myself that aren't from the HelloFresh box. So I just tend to have, like, some on hand. So I've got all of my ingredients, um, and now we read to the recipe and work out what um, equipment we need. So I will leave my chopping board, which is not on top of the fridge, it's over here because I've uh, just taken it off the drying rack. So chopping board and knifey. Um, and it says uh, preheat your oven to 220 degrees. Uh, that gets done afterwards. Um, I'm not going to do that now. Uh, chop the sweet potatoes into one centimetre wedges. It says no need to peel. I don't know why it says that because sweet potato skin is not very nice. I peel them. And this is the thing, I don't peel regular potatoes, sort of, ever. Like, if I'm doing a very fancy roast potatoes Christmas meal style, where I sort of, where I fluff them with flour, where I pre-boil them, fluff them with flour, and then roast them, like, in a layer of fat, then I, then I uh, peel my potatoes. But otherwise, everything I do with potatoes, even mashed potatoes, I leave the skin on. I like the flavour. Um, but, but sweet potato skin is manky, so uh, I will have to get my, my, my uh, peeler out. Put on a large roasting tray, drizzle with oil and season with salt and pepper. Um, and again, because ro things that you roast don't reheat very well, they just go soggy. Um, I mean, you could re-roast them, but then if you're going to do that, you might as well just not roast them in the first place and roast them again the next day. So what I will do is I'll have my tub ready for, um, for like half the potatoes. Um, so I'll chop up, so I'll peel, chop up the potatoes, half of them will go in the oven and half of them will go in the fridge and again, that's for tomorrow. So preheat your oven, chop the sweet potatoes, put on a large roasting tray. I've got to crash. Oh, there. that's the tray. And uh, roast in the top shelf of your oven for 20 to 25 minutes, turn halfway through cooking. Uh, meanwhile, trim and thinly slice the spring onions, grate the cheddar, drain and rinse the black beans in a sieve. So, get out my sieve. Uh, get out my cheese grater. And the spring onions are going to be scattered over the top, so I'll get a little tub. A little tub to put those in. Half the black beans in a bowl and mash until broken up, set aside for later. Um, mashing, you can use a potato masher, but they don't fit nicely in the sort of bowl that I'm going to use. And it, it honestly, there's a bit that the beans aren't hard, so I'll just use a fork. And I'll also get the bowl. And while I'm in here, I will also get the bowl I'm going to use to uh, eat out of. This is my slightly fancier bowl uh, that I got from. Uh, a fancy sandwich range because it's the right size and I was again I was looking in shops for like two years to wait till I got one that was the right size and depth because it's uh as you can see sort of it's, it's like it's that depth a lot of them are too shallow and too wide this is this was the size bowl I wanted so that's going to go in the oven ready to be it's in my second oven because the main oven is obviously going to be far too hot um and other things that I'll need to eat this with um, is going to be obviously a spoon and uh, won't need a knife I don't think, fork and spoon will be fine but I will need my juice as well, what flavour juice is open at the moment, orange and mango, so that's all ready, oh I know what I was going to do, I'll have to do that later. Um, Oh, I, I'm going to prep some dessert. Now, what I was going to do before I started filming was just quickly chop some strawberries and put sugar on them, and that was just for me, um, so that the the, straw, the the sugar had time to absorb. Also, I've just looked out the window and noticed, because it's been nice and sunny all day, um, I was thinking, oh, the weather's turned, and there's just a black cloud. 
just in a bar along the horizon that's, uh, that's encroaching. I was like, oh dear. So it's going to start chucking it in a minute. Right, anyway. Uh, zest. I can use grate for that and halve your lime. Peel a grate of garlic. I will use a garlic press. Watched a TV show the other day where the chef was saying, oh no, don't use a dreadful garlic press. Just use, just, you need to chop it nice and fine. And A, that's incredibly fucking fiddly. Um, and B, I, the garlic is, is, unless you're doing like garlic bread or something, it's not the main feature of a dish. It's just like, it's a background flavour. I bet he would not be able to tell. If, you, if, if I served him a bowl of two bowls of this, one with chopped up garlic and one with garlic pressed garlic, he would not tell the difference. Pretentious. Anyway, um, you need to just avoid the frying pan on a high heat. When the oil is hot, add the beef mince and the bacon lardons and cook until browned five to six minutes. Use a wooden spoon to break up the beef as it cooks. Drain any excess fat. So, a couple of my nice big pans. Uh, and my wooden spatulas which uh, are too big to, well they're not they're not too big to go in the drawer actually but a lot of my other things are the potato mash the door doesn't the drawer doesn't shut if you put the potato masher in it so the potato masher lives in a jar on my windowsill which means I've put since, since I'm going to have a jar I might as well keep the whisk and the big spoon and things like that there as well add the Mexican spice and the garlic cook for one to two minutes add the tomato passata uh, barbecue sauce, water, the amount of water needed is 100 ml. So we'll do our usual for piddly small amounts of water, which is uh, a jug, an overfilled jug, plus uh, some spoons and some measuring cups. Um, add the beans, season with salt and pepper, boil, reduce the heat, simmer until thick, 10 to 12 minutes, stirring occasionally. While your sauce simmers, mix the soured cream and the lime zest and season with salt and pepper. And, once, and then once the sauce is cooked, taste and season them. Um, and once you've got the wedges done, put them into a bowl, top with the beef and beanie sauce, grate, add on the grated cheese, then the sour cream and the sliced spring onion, serve with blue sublime. So um, I need a tub to keep the half of lime that I'm not going to use in. Um, and I'm going to need several more tubs because I'm going to need one for the beef when it's done but also one for the sour cream so there's a lot of prep um, and so I'll just quickly run that recipe again without me interrupting myself getting things and to check that I've got everything so preheat oven to 220 degrees chop sweet potatoes into one centimeter wedges uh, drizzle with oil salt and pepper uh, roast in our top shelf of oven 20 to 25 minutes uh, and obviously I'm going to not put the wedges in until I've started everything else, but the wedges need to go for about 25 minutes. The beef takes um, 6 minutes plus 2 minutes plus 12 minutes, which is 20 minutes. Which So th it, it takes about the same time as the wedges in the end. Like that, that's, that adds up to 20 minutes and there'll be a bit of fiddling in between. So that's why it's best to sort of start everything off with this. Um, like if I'd started cooking the wedges and go, oh, I've got to chop all of these things. Once I'd done that, the wedges will be done by the time that the beef was only half cooked. And I've realised I've interrupted myself again. So, uh, preheat oven, da, 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 da. so sweet potatoes in oven. Uh, trim and thinly slice spring onions, grate cheddar, rinse black the beans in a sieve, pop the beans in a bowl and mash until broken up, set aside for later. Zest and halve lime, peel and grate garlic. Um, Put oil in the frying pan on a high heat, high heat. Add the beef, mince and bacon lardons and cook for six minutes. Add the Mexican spice and garlic, cook for one or two minutes. Add the tomato passata, barbecue sauce, water, beans, whole land mashed. Season with salt and pepper, bring to the boil, then simmer for 12 minutes. Um, mix the sour cream with lime zest and season with salt and pepper once cooked taste and season with salt and pepper and when then once the sauce is cooked taste and season that with salt and pepper um, put the wedges in a bowl top with the beef and beanie sauce and then add grated cheese lime sour cream sliced spring onion and wedges of lime so that's the meal um, and like i said um completely separate to that now i'm just going to quickly slice some strawberries and sprinkle on some sugar and then put the bowl in the fridge and that's the dessert for much later in the day it's quite early in the day at the moment. Well, not quite early, it's about five o'clock. Um, but it's earlier than I'd have tea. 
um, normally. So this is going to be um, something I eat a chunk later to um, with because I'm going to because I'm watching some theatre tonight. Actually, I'm going to watch Touching the Void, a Bristol Old Vic live stream. Right, so down there, I want to tilt and carry on tilting. So, short interjection, um, the camera stopped filming there and I didn't notice for a few minutes. Um, I did notice before I actually started doing the main bit of the recipe, so that's all fine and there's nothing missing. But the bit you did miss was A, I cut up some strawberries and put some sugar on them, that's not very interesting. But I did also tell the story about the baby bird, which you um, would miss. Um, if uh, I didn't interject it now, um, and it was, an, I thought it was a nice story. So even though um, I'm not currently uh, obviously doing the cooking, I'll, I'll just fill it in quickly here. So I was uh, mowing the lawn, and um, I noticed a little baby bird jumping around on the path, and it sort of managed to do a hop, sort of about eight inches high, and flutter, and then fell back down again. So it obviously couldn't uh, fly properly. Um, and I didn't know what type of bird it was, but uh, then a, I was looking around the garden, trying to see if there were any mummy or daddy birds around. Um, and uh, the bird was doing the cheap, cheap, cheap that they do to attract attention. And eventually there was an answering reply from a blue tit. So it was a baby blue tit. Um, and then looking at it more closely, I could see it had a, uh, like, it didn't have the colours yet, but it had a marking around its head. Um, that uh, made me go, yes, that's a blue tit. And then so I, I backed away uh, to see what would happen and the bird had sort of hopped under a picnic table that there is in the garden. I, I say that there is in the garden because I didn't buy it. It came with the house and I've just sort of left it there and occasionally use it when I sit outside. So it hopped under there where the grass hadn't been cut yet. Um, and I think it got kind of stuck in the long grass because gra I'd let the grass get very long. Um, and I watched for about 45 minutes, actually, it was just because it was just nice. It was just peaceful, just watching this uh, bird family drama uh, unfold. So and I eventually moved because I thought I might be even though I was standing like quite far back, I thought I might be too close and might be scaring it by standing out in the in the middle of the grass. So I went to my back door and sat on the steps um and just watched the blue tit sort of it hopped it would go from sort of a, a nearby tree to the washing line to the t top of the table and would sort of pip under the table so i think it knew where the baby bird was and it was trying to encourage it to move sort of out into the open so possibly they could help it fly i don't know where the nest was there's a birdhouse on the wall um but i don't know if they're occupying it they did seem to land on it occasionally uh, the adult blue tits, but I don't know if they're actually using it. And they did land on the uh, ivy that's covering my shed. My shed is now more um, ivy than shed. Um, and yes, I just watched and at, at some point a second bird, like the uh, the other parent, came along and helped. And they, were, they usually weren't both by the bird at the same time. Like one would be um, under the table and one would be sort of like slightly further away, possibly keeping watch. Um, and they'd switch around a bit and basically I just watched the blue tit family drama of them trying to and they went back to the table a lot of times and then I noticed a little bit later on like after it had been over half an hour they were swooping more they were more swooping um, I'm doing an arm movement swooping towards a patch in the lawn instead um, and so the birds had obviously moved out from under the table and it had moved further moved further away um, down the garden um, and at that point I'd like I've been sitting there for 45 minutes uh, so I sort of packed up and uh, went inside and I did go out later um, just before I started the cooking you just saw and I couldn't see the bird sitting on the floor anywhere so hopefully it got to it got to somewhere safely but yes that was just a nice 45 minutes where I sat out on a fairly warm afternoon watching the birds so that was the story that you missed by um, my camera stopping for a little while um, and now I will take you back to the regularly scheduled um, beans and potato wedges it stopped filming for no particular reason and I'm not sure why um, I just all I did was uh, you got because like, it was definitely there for some of the strawberries and I, I'll, I'll just finish saying what I was saying but I'm not sure why that stopped um, hopefully you heard all of the bird story I'm fairly sure you did because I, I was looking at the camera for some of the time and I think it only just turned off when I went over to wash my knife but just in case uh, the strawberries yeah just 
sliced up, covered in sugar, and I'll put cream on them later. And now they're in the fridge just waiting with the sugar, and that'll all be very nice. So then what I was saying was, I don't know why that's stopped, because there's plenty of battery. It says there's plenty of battery. Uh. So I'm going to now try and adjust the uh, camera. We'll try, try on this side for now. There we go. And yes, after all, we're like way into the video before we even get started. Um, and obviously my prep takes longer because I'm reading out to you when normally I'd read it out in my head, which is faster than reading it out loud. And I only need to do it the once as I go and pick everything up and then once more quickly to know what I'm doing. Like, so basically, because when I, what I do is I read the recipe once to get all the stuff out and then read it, like interrupting myself, um, fetching things and then read it once more all the way through to know what I need to do. But I don't need to make digressions when I do that. So obviously reading it to you takes longer. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm ready to start um, after all that. Right. Um, what order are we going to do things in? Um, I'm going to make the sour cream first because it's quick. So we'll need a tub, right, and I'll just quickly say it's two sweet potatoes, one spring onion, 30 grams of shredded cheddar cheese, one carton of black beans, half a lime, one or more cloves of garlic, 120 grams of beef mince, 60 grams of bacon lardons, one sachet of Mexican spice, which is uh, five grams, one carton of tomato passata, um, one sachet of barbecue sauce, I'm just going to use all of what I made, uh, 100 ml of water and 75 grams of sour cream. The carton of tomato passata, does it say 200 grams? And the carton of black beans is 390 grams net, 230 drained. Right, so open this up. So I've got my carton of sour cream. I don't know if this is the better angle or the down is the better angle, but for some reason I'm having trouble getting the down. It, it worked fine the first time. Um, and now I just can't quite get the same down angle and it doesn't look as nice. So, do right. So open the sour cream. It would be better with the scissors, but I can't be asked to get them dirty and wash them. And this is going to be the same uh, sour cream you saw me make when I was doing the guacamole uh, with the remaining sour cream and lime, which is just, uh, I'm going to zest the lime, mix it with the sour cream. The other reason I'm doing this in, uh, this first is also because um, I can then take the, take the lime out of the tub and then grate the cheese into it. Otherwise, I've got no tub to grate the cheese into because obviously the, I zest the lime using the cheese grater. So that's some sour cream. That's more sour cream. And then roll the lime just to get it nice and ready to juice. And in this case, we're not going to need juice, so because we don't actually add the lime juice, we just squeeze the wedges on afterwards. But so we do need the zest, so zesty, zesty, zesty. Yes. Oh, I did watch Pink Mist, uh, finally, when I was mentioning that I wanted to see. I'd misdreamed it slightly, and I thought it was about four boys to go to watch. It was about three. Um, and it is, it's, um, it's very grim. Uh, but it's, it was a stage very well. I think they could have done more with the staging. I mean, they did, they did some very good stuff. They did a lot of synchronised. They basically had, because... It is, an, it is very poetical, it's basically, it's not, not there's a tiny section of dialogue, but it's mostly long speeches that are also in some bits in sort of rhythm and rhyme like poetry. Um, and they basically had the ensemble on stage for the entire time. So all three boys, plus uh, the wife, the girlfriend and the mother, plus I think two people who are just basically sort of extra ensemble. So um, half of this is going to go in a tub in the fridge and half has been wedged and will go next to my plate. Anyways, they made, and they made um, a very, um, so they were doing a lot of stuff synchronised and that worked very well. Um, it's when they were sort of being at war and being sold in the way they were moving together and they did some 
very long interstitial dance bits, basically where it's like, okay, where well, the script basically goes, okay, we're at a party. And then they'd like be partying like they're at a disco for sort of the entire three or four minute length of the song. Um, and that all worked quite well, but I still think this, you could just do so much more. It was also interestingly, because um, it was being filmed, but it wasn't obviously, it was, uh, and it was being filmed to be filmed, if you know what I mean. Um, but there was also, there was, um, at that particular performance, there was a uh, sign language interpreter who was signing it. But because of the way they were filming it, which was trying to obviously get close-ups on people's faces and different angles, you could only see her sometimes in the background, which obviously means that the... Um, although the recording is subtitled, so you know it's accessible in a different way. Um, it, did, it, did, it did have closed captions available, but it would have been interesting to sort of have the um, interpreters be shown more. Cause, um, some people find that sort of thing distracting. I don't. I like seeing um, seeing things like that, and I like things. To, I, I like theatre to be accessible. The Theatre Royal in Bath sometimes for plays where you can get the script for it. So it's only been a couple of Shakespeare plays, not but they have what is counts as a subtitled play, which is where they put um, screens in the boxes and display the script as it's as the play is going along, um, which is awesome. But obviously they can do I think with things where the script's freely electronically available, such as Shakespeare and a couple of operas. They do it for operas to translate them as well. All right, that's the sour cream. That's nice. Take it off. Right, uh, next thing to do, uh, potatoes. And I need to wash because I'm going to peel. I'll just put my bag closer as well to get my cooked peelings. But yes, back to mentally pinkness. It is, um, it was, yeah, it was a good play. Uh, and the actors they had were very good. Um, and it vaguely mentioned one of them's in the crown, and one of them's gone on to do something famous. Oh, one of them's Olivier, one of them's one of them Olivier, and one of them's gone on to be in the crown. But I can't remember which ones because uh, names don't mean much to me. But in it, it's very, it's in it, the ending, I think, was the strongest part as well, which is the, uh, like, where basically one of them goes back and his girlfriend's going to ask him when he finishes his tour not to go back again. Because basically, I'm going to spoil the plot here, but like, it, it, it's, it's um, war is hell, so you can feel fairly sure they're going. One of them gets his legs blown off and has to come and uh, is shipped home. One of them's in a friendly fire incident and is it badly injured and is shipped home and he recovers uh, from his physical injuries but still has dreadful PTSD and one of them isn't injured and he's the one who sort of, he feels he's to blame because he's the one who talked them into joining the army in the first place um, and he's comes back for some R&R &R, but then leaves again to finish his tour and dies. Um, and he's like, but he was like, well, I want to go. I wanted to go back, even though it's awful because there's, uh, I don't really fit into the normal life anymore. And then also says like, because you, you you have your squadron and you have like your your mates and you have the people fighting next to you. And in the end, you're not fighting for queen and country. You're fighting for the blokes next to you. Uh, which uh, and, and because you hate the enemy and because they hurt you and it, it is basically a, so, and, it, and again it's condemning this attitude to be clear it's not saying and that's a wonderful camar example of camaraderie it's saying it's messed up you're not fight you're not fighting for any reason you're just getting revenge for what's been done to you and they're getting revenge for what's been done to them um, except in this case also because it's the um, war in Afghanistan um, we we're also invading their country um, and yeah, there is a whole I think thing to be criticised generally where you do a because the, where you do a play and it's about oh the terrible impact that war has on the people who go there and it, it's uh, go there and do this and it's like that's true and it is terrible and there isn't enough m mental health support there isn't enough support, support generally but um, at the same time that's you can't explore it or you not in this, not in sort of ninety minutes with a cast of six. Um, also then explore 
what war does to the country that's being occupied, which is, of course, far worse, because that's, um, there's all of the, the young men there who feel they need to fight to protect their homeland um, in a way that just isn't true for the people who are joining from the UK and America, but also, um, like, whatever propaganda says, like, we, we're not worried about being invaded. Um, it's also... Uh, like the war doesn't affect us as civilians unless we're also re related to a soldier whereas their civilians are there being dying and being injured and so it's basically there's not any like it at least mentions that and at least like nods to that but it can't deal with that in a deep way and it can't do that both at the same time but it does become a thing where it's like isn't more dreadful for hurting the poor I'm going to say white here, but um, specifically, again, one of the three uh, characters that goes to war, one of them um, is uh, an um, the son of an immigrant from Somalia. And, um, so, so I've uh, peeled my potato. It doesn't matter if there's a few scraps of skin. So like I say, it doesn't taste nice, but if, as long as it's mostly gone, then you're fine. All right, so the potato is peeled. So that peeler can go in the sink to be washed as well. So like, I think, oh, there's a comedian now, I can't remember which one it is, who, um, the worst thing about being a person from country A is that first they come, first the Americans come and smash your stuff and then 20 years later they make a film about how sad they were about doing it. Um, and to win it, sweet potato is also a lot harder than a regular potato, so it could be worth getting the big knife out. But I started with this one now, and I don't really want to wash it with another knife, so I shall I'll manage from this bit, this point on. But uh, yes, so it's it's a very good war is hell, and it doesn't. I think it can't cover all perspectives, and, I, and, it, and it doesn't try to. And I think that's all right. Um, I'm just going to grab some water as well. Um, but for doing what it does, which is uh, war is hell, as looking at uh, three British boys, 17, 18 and 19 years old, going to the war in Afghanistan, I think that's, st that's still relevant. And um, like I say, it's a very powerful ending with like a, you know, don't think thinking about going to war and it's like think about what that means anyway that's my talking about theatre and now I need to concentrate on chopping the sweet potato which is basically I just sort of make chips and these are I think um, small this half small enough that I don't need to halve any of them and obviously when I've chopped all the chips there we go then I do the second half and this one I think some of them and I'm doing sort of them like this this ish wide and these I would to make everything roughly the same size I'd then cut into two parts themselves so there's an outside bit and an inside bit and just chop these uh, and I'm keeping them smaller as well uh, to, to again make sure that they cook and, and there we go and there's going to be plenty of chips here Thanks. Oh, I probably shouldn't have cut that one in half. Though. I don't. Want, I always don't. You also don't want them too small, or they burn. And it's nice to have a few big, a few big ones. So I'll keep a few big ones. But so yeah, we're now. So now we have exhausted um, the theatre that um, I've seen and the baby bird. Although that was. I did just sit. Like I say, I was just sitting there looking, just being happy. That was nice. Just no pressure, no worrying about anything. This has got a hole in it, so I'm going to chop that end off. And again, this one's got bits in it, so you can just cut the bits out. The same bits. It's basically there were splits and there was holes in the potato where I think an animal has been in. 
So just uh, remove those bits and that'll be fine. And I'll just add that bit of roughness as well. And that, uh, there we go. And that will probably be two chips. And this is a bit like you can see that, that where it's come in. I can just You shouldn't cut towards yourself, by the way, but I'm fairly confident in my handling of the knife. And there's not another convenient um, way to do it. So I think one that I'll leave. There's, oh, there we go. Right, okay, and now again split them into two piles, the pile that goes in the oven and the pile that's for tomorrow and because I'm weird and obsessive I will split them into like direct rather than just picking up a handful of each I will sigh, pick up two bits of roughly the same size um, and put one in each because I am very weird. So yeah, we've uh, covered the theatre, covered the baby bird. Um, what else is there that I can talk about? Um, I think they'll probably well, they'll probably end up being poetry because this there's a, like a ten minute stretch where all that's got to do is simmer and all the things got to do in the oven is sit in the oven. Um, and in the meanwhile, um, there'll be some washing up, but not very much. So uh, there's that you can look forward to. I'm sure everyone's on the edge of their seat trying to decide which poem. So I don't pick in advance what poems I'm going to read. I just sort of flick through the book and see what catches my eye. In this case, where they're in an even number, I go, right, well, that's thicker. And this one's quite thin, so it's roughly so much. Right, OK, so that one. In the fridge, ready for tomorrow. And again, even though it's sliced, um, some people would put that in water. I don't bother, and it's perfectly fine. Be good till tomorrow. Um, the cheese also needs grating, ready for sprinkling. Um, the just, oh, the cheese is going to go under, under going on top. I will probably add more cheese. I think. Where is my block of cheese? Because I also, I have cheddar cheese just in the fridge just generally. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grate all of this plus a bit extra. And then um, the, uh, I've got a lid for this. Which I think I'm gonna add. That's, that's okay with the grating. So I'll pop that on and then when the time comes, I'll sprinkle half on now and leave half for tomorrow. And again, pre-grating cheese is fine. Uh, if you can't grate cheese, bags of grated cheese are just fine. They do, um, basically because of the surface area exposed to cheese, um, grated cheese doesn't taste very nice, especially if it's if it's been out for any length of time because of the exposure to the air, so it just sort of dries um, and becomes a bit flavourless and anemic. So um, if you're getting grated cheese and it's just for one, seal the bag up tight and even then it's not going to necessarily keep, keep well once you've opened it, even if it's not got mouldy. But um, if you like cheese and can't grate your own, then buying grated cheese is better than not having cheese. Yeah, I'm very much in the um, all, all food fuels you. Um, all food is good. Um, if you can't cook a complicated meal, cook a simple one. Just last night, I was going to film it and I just decided I couldn't be bothered um, because it was so quick. But I probably will at some point. Is um, I just had one of those packet noodles, that like like the batch of super noodles basically, where you boil some water, put in the noodles, put in the flavour sachet, wait four minutes and it's done. Um, and that was basically uh, because I didn't, A, I didn't want anything massive to eat, but also it's, um, it's just, it's quick and I, it had got quite late um, and I wanted to go to bed soon, so I was like, well, rather than cook something big, that's enough cheese. Rather than cook something big, I'll cook something uh, quick. Um, and it's if you, like again, if you're hungry, whatever gets the food in you, like whatever you need to do to um, 
make sure you get fed up with this and washing up. Uh, so whether it's uh, that instant noodles or a pot noodle or just some cheese and biscuits or just get, getting what I've, I've done sometimes is just getting what do I have in the fridge? I've got some smoked salmon, um, some cheese triangles and some uh, pepperoni sticks. So uh, that's a meal. I'm throwing my cheese away. The cheese is fine. The cheese is back in the fridge. Um, and basically, yeah, that's whatever gets whatever gets the food into you is good. Um, because it can it can be hard to cook just just from complicated and time reasons, but it can also just be tiring. Uh, you can have had a long day. Uh, or you can have, oh, I need to get, I didn't get the scissors out earlier and I need them anyway for the passata. Um, there, there is a drying rack, because we used them for something last night. The beans have a tear thing, so I don't need the um, scissors for the beans. But so uh, yes, whatever the uh, whatever is necessary to get you fed. Right, I'm going to over to the sink with the sieve and basically you just pour the beans in the sieve, run some water through it, and give it a bit of a shake, and then I just leave it to drip in the sink uh, for a little while. Yes, food can be hard, so whatever gets it um, gets it down, you get some calories into you. Um, whatever tastes good as well, like if it's much better to eat food that you like because it tastes good than uh, say like oh I should be eating more healthy, so I'm going to try and make this a salad, but it's a salad, but it's a salad made of things that you don't like, so you'd end up not eating any of it. No, make make food that you enjoy. And like it's better to have like all things in moderation. Like a pizza every night's not great for you, but at the same time, if a pizza every night is what's getting food in you so you don't starve, that's better than starving. So just do what gets you fed. Right, so now I just need to I'm gonna Wash out this cup so it can go in the recycling. And wash the beans. And I think uh, black beans and kidney beans are my favourite beans, I think. Right, and we want, need to, we want the garlic. I need to decide how many cloves I need because certainly more than one. Uh, this big one and these two, I think, and then this can go in the cupboard. And again, we peel the garlic, just tweeze the end of it, and just pull the uh, pull the skin off. Put the skin in the bag. One clove of garlic and then chop the end off. And obviously just chop the end off both of those as well. And again, because we're using extra little cloves of garlic, I don't need to worry about uh, cutting slightly too much off at the end. It won't matter because I've got plenty of garlic. Plenty of garlic. The only thing is sometimes you do get like little bits of skin and you have to scrape them off with a nail, but uh, Normally it's fine. And we've got the two bigger pieces. Again. And you also, I also check the garlic just for um, sometimes it'll have dark marks and then you just cut them off. Um, but then also, ooh, that's starting to get a bit old, go a bit dry in the middle there. So again, and again, there's this is garlic out of my cupboard rather than necessarily the HelloFresh garlic. So, because uh, I've put in extra. So, uh, 
It's not their fault if it's a bit a bit old now. And then just chop, I uh, just yeah, halve the uh, cloves so that they fit into the garlic press better, basically. This one's got terrible amounts of fluff on it, right? So, garlic chopped, so. Just double check what other prep work I need to do. I need to mash half the beans. Um, I need to, uh, again, break up the mince, which I always do in advance. And I need to slice the three onions. Um, and obviously I'm going to do, like I said, do extra spring onions. So spring onion number one. She's also very muddy, which I hadn't noticed. That's in the bag, so I'm going to have to wash this. Yeah. I've also got uh, a bag of extra string onions. Um, I think the second reasonably sized one will do, and the other can go in the fridge for the. Uh, Using it on anything else that I want to think of. And so, knock the top of that one as well. I'm just going to stick these under it. I don't know if I wouldn't bother with the spring, but that one was so muddy. And then with spring onions, um, I usually cut off at the point where it starts growing multiple sprouts. You could, you can go further up the stem, but that's uh, that's where I limit it. And then uh, I always do a thin slice down and just take off the top layer of skin as well. Which again is a why I normally don't bother washing them because I take that the skin off anyway. But also the outer skin is the toughest. Um, okay, so now I'm just going to slice this into little bits, and again. Sprinkle on half at the end and uh, leave half for tomorrow. Just keep popping them into the little tub. Is it takes a long time to cook, it takes much less time to eat the thing. So it sometimes feels your time investment is a bit skewed, but uh, I do enjoy cooking, so that's worth doing. And, uh, and yeah, all of the greens and all the whites. Sometimes you'll get a recipe which calls for putting half of the spring onions in to cook with and half to sprinkle over. Um, and in, if that's the case, you put the whites in to cook with and the uh, greens the bits you keep as the salad. Right, and the last thing is the bean mash. Well, I've got that just, just as well, but then the bean mashing is the last thing. That's uh... sorry, I'm, I'm opening the Mexican spice in advance, just so uh, everything's ready. Um, I, also, oh, I also need to oil and salt these uh, wedges, and I think now is about the time when because it needs to. The oven's on at two twenty, so. Um, so let's give it time to heat up. I'm going to put the oven on now. Fetch my beans. Which have washed and been draining. As it says, you want to just pop that on there and then throw that one in. Chucked on the floor away. Just trying to escape. And then put half of the beans in the bowl and mash them. This is just so basically it's got a thick texture but also nice whole beans 
in there. So that's about half and half. I'm very bad at joke. This is why I also do the one and one when I'm count for things that I'm count like chips that I'm counting. Uh, or why I can't, why I sort of do one and one because I'm very bad at judging distances and sizes. I can't judge distance very well at all, um, and I'm very bad at judging if that was actually anywhere near half, or if there's more more in one than the other. But yeah, this mashes like I say. I'm mashing it with a fork, and it mashes as you can see very easily. Uh, is there a good angle? For this? No, a good angle for this. I could put, point the camera further downwards, but I'm not going to mess with adjusting now because I'm just going to put up on a thing to show into the frying pan in a second. And yeah, just keep mushing, mushing as I can say this. This bowl is particularly, I know because I've probed it before, it's too small for a potato masher, it doesn't fit right to the bottom. Um, but also you've invented this in a wider bowl they mash so easily with a fork that uh, it doesn't feel worth it trying to get them getting the potato masher out because it's uh, more of a pain to clean whereas I'm going to eat with this fork anyway. So yes, reducing the amount of washing up is a big preoccupation just because it's uh, just because I cook cooking for myself so obviously I cook and I have to do all the washing up whereas if I was uh, with someone if I'd cooked they would do the washing up and vice versa obviously. So yes, that is a Virtual division. Right, so that's now all mashed up. You can see uh, there, and I'm just going to add the beans now, the remaining beans, just so that there's one bowl for pouring. And I'm going to, again, put that in the sink. There's a little pile of washing up dry leftover from the last time. I do it as I go along, but because I know there's going to be a bit where everything's in the pan and everything's in the oven. Um, I'm basically going there, it's uh, fine. I'm going to leave that fork there, by the way, to uh, scoop it out into the pan when the time comes. And now with these, now I want a dry hand, so I'll dry them on my uh, cooking cooking cloth. I'll open the lard on this, ready. And yeah, as I said, the... the, the um, Wedges will take 25, 20 to 25 minutes, but the the uh, beef will take just over 20. So I'm going to start everything off at the same time. Um, and I will actually do the uh, oil, salt and pepper on these first. Um, so I'll start everything off at the same time and then the wedges will be back ready to come out once the, uh, once the beef is cooked. So um, it's going in the oven, so that's olive oil rather than uh, salt and pepper. And what I do is I sprinkle over the salt, sprinkle on the light coating on everything, give it a couple of grinds of pepper, and then just drizzle over, and I'm doing my two fingers on the thing again to control the pour because otherwise it just tips out and you get lots of oil. And there's just a drizzle of oil all over. And then the messy thing is you then rub them all together to cover them in the oil and the salt and the pepper. Um, so that they're all covered and then you scatter them over the tray. And it says turn over and I think it possibly means you should go and turn each individual turn when a turn. It says when cooked, turn halfway through cooking. Um, and I sometimes think that means, oh, you should turn it over so both sides get done. But like, that's incredibly fiddly and a pain for something like this. So I just turn the tray around. Which also I think needs, does need to be done because otherwise things at the back look faster than uh, things at the front. So possibly that's what they mean, but I'm never sure. So I just go with my interpretation. Right. So that's ready to go in, but I'm not going to pop it in yet because the oven's not heated up. Um, and for the beef, we'll be using sunflower oil to show you that um, because vegetable oil is better in a pan because it has a it can get hotter without getting burnt basically olive oil for uh, the oven vegetable oil for the pan is is my rule which I vaguely think is the one they send the, they told us at the cooking school but I might have got it the wrong way around but it works for me so right so open up the uh, 
really not very generous piece of meat. This is 120 grams, as I said, and just split it all up. So the oven's preheating to 220 degrees. Sweet potatoes are wedges with uh, oil, salt, and pepper. They go in the oven for 25 minutes. I've sliced the spring onions, I've grated the cheddar, um, I've drained and rinsed the black beans and mashed half of them. I've zested my lime. I've got my garlic peeled and ready to be crushed. Um, and the next thing to do is oil on a high heat, um, beef and bacon for six minutes, and then Mexican spice and garlic for two minutes, then tomato passata, barbecue sauce, water, beans, salt and pepper, leave for 12 minutes. I've made the uh, sour cream with lime zest, salt and, salt and pepper. Did I put salt and pepper in? I can't remember. Yes, I did, I did, but I remember now. Um, I remember seeing the black specks. That's also why, hand, why putting pepper in is handy, it's partly for the flavour, but you can also you can see that you've done it, where a salt blends in. to go. I'm actually going to the Mexican spice goes with the garlic. I was saying this was going to mess the water in advance, but the thing is the water is useful for clearing out the tomato passata so I won't. So they're ready to go. Move them by the pan. This is my bowl of done um, and I'm going to put this in the wash and this will go in the wash as well actually not because it got dirty particularly but because I might like to make sure to wash it um, don't wash it every time because usually it just sits under the thing and doesn't get anything on it um, but I used to like to wash it every so often just to make sure it is clean so I'm going to move this bag up here out of the way there's still rubbish to go in it because uh, this plastic th that's going in the recycling for the bacon, but this plastic, uh, this thing for the for the spice mix, uh, still need to go in the bin. Okay, now I'm gonna um, turn the turn the fan on, turn the hob on. And it says a high heat, which for me is this is a the medium ring on a three side. There's a small, basically, I've got a small hob, a medium hob, and a large hob on here, and. Um, um, the medium hob, but medium in the middle of the strip is uh, what I do for a high heat. Now I'm going to try and balance this so that you can look into the pan. This is the sort of thing that you wouldn't see when people do proper editing because uh, they've cut that bit out. But uh, with me, you get to see what sort of pain it is with just your camera. But you can see into the pan nicely. That's good. Right. So I've set my timer for 25 minutes. Again, I'm just going to flick this, I'm just going to go down on the oven, oh and it's over 200 degrees, so that's fine. So I'm going to put this in the oven now, top shelf, start the timer, and chuck in the beef and the bacon. And again, if you handle the raw meat, um, wash your hands, I was quite careful there and it didn't actually touch the meat. and then just shut it round. And this went with it about 24 and a half minutes. So it's about 19 and a half minutes to do the next step. Yeah, this looks for 
soy particulate, uh, 24 and a half to 19 and a half is five minutes. So it's about 19 minutes. This is done, or not done, done, but to the next step. So, and uh, that's just what that looks like. And basically you keep breaking it up into even smaller pieces. This is why I break it up in advance. By the way, it's much harder to break up in the pan, I find. Um, and just keep moving it around. You're also supposed to drain the fat off later, but I find that to be a massively tedious exercise of you pour the pan and it, you can't, but you're trying to pour the fat out without pouring the meat out and you're trying to use this to stop it and it just doesn't work. So I just leave the fat in. I'm fine with that. And I just keep everything moving around so that everything gets nice and round all over. And uh, yes, now there's a lot of waiting. So, uh, kind of I'll let you look at this, stay looking at the pan while I cook. And basically what I'll do is I'll come and coat it this every so often. The owl and the pussy cat. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh lovely pussy, oh pussy my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, what a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh let us be married, too long we have carried, but what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bomb tree grows. And there in the woods, a piggy wig stood with a ring at the end of his nose. His nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said piggy, I will. So they took it away or married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mint and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand, on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon. The moon, the moon, they danced by the light of the moon. That is, of course, Edward, The Owl and the Pussycat by Edward Lear. Um, I like the phrase runcible spoon. It's complete nonsense. Edward Lear wrote um, a lot of very bad limericks and a lot of very good other things. I, li I like the Quangle Wangle. Um, the Quangle Wangle Quay. Um, which I also always reminds me of the Demon Headmaster, if anyone remembers that, the TV series, which is bloody terrifying, where there's one series where everyone's being spied on by cameras in, in little badges shaped like green hands. Um, but because it's been set up by the demon head master, who fundamentally doesn't understand humans or creativity, um, they can be, uh, basically, you, make, you can make them stop transmitting and break by speaking nonsense into them. One of the bits of nonsense is to long sight and a bit of the kind of wangle quake. On top of the crum crumpety tree, the Quangle Wangle sat, but his face you could not see on account of his beaver hat. His hat was 102 feet wide, with ribbons and bibbons on every side, ribbons and bibbons and loops and lace, that nobody ever could see the face of the Quangle Wangle tree. Uh, that's from memory, and that's the only bit I can remember, because it's a much longer poem. I do like, I do like Edward Lear. Like I said, his children's arms are better than his limericks, because his limericks, um, he always has the first line be the same as the last line, which isn't as good. There was, a bit, there was a bit on QI about this. And you can see this is already going quite quite brown and crispy. Um, and it's going to have two more minutes with the garlic and the uh, thing. So um, we're on 20 minutes now, which isn't long enough. But I will just turn the heat down just slightly. Not all the way down, but just a bit down. Um, and I am at 19 minutes and 30. I am going to put in the, uh, the garlic and the powder and I'm only going to do it for, uh, for one minute, not two. And like I say, just once it gets to this stage, basically you want to keep it moving around the pan to stop it to stop any bits of it burning. But it's nice for it to be browned all over. That's all flavour. Right. Okay. So we're on 1930-ish. Um, 33. So sprinkle over the spice and squeeze in the garlic, lots of garlic, there we go. And it's like, it would be easy to slightly press, to press the garlic in advance, but then you've got, something, you've got to have something to put it in, which is again, more washing up. 
uh, which as I have said is my avoiding flamenco. Right, so we're on 19 minutes, so on 18 minutes we're going to uh, stop, um, or not stop, we're going to do the next step, which will be basically adding everything else. Oops, getting a knob there. Oh, that smells nice. And I, just, I do want to get all of the spice in, all of the spice out of the packet. Um, and my brush will go away now because everything else is going inside here. Right. Next will be tomato passata, barbecue sauce, water and beans. Along with a bit of salt and pepper. And the garlic press needs to go into the uh, sink, but I'll do that in a second. But yeah, again, keep stirring all of that through, so this time to make sure everything gets covered in the garlic and the spice, and all doesn't look look nice. And if you were draining the beef, obviously it'd be slightly less oily, but at the same time, that looks really tasty. Right, and now tomato passata. Water. 100ml. Try not to throw your things onto the floor. So 100ml, and you do it in the tomato passata carton because that way you get all of the extra stuff off the sides. I'll stir that round. Then the barbecue sauce. Oh, look at that. Lovely. And like I said, after I made it, um, it, I don't think I cooked it for quite long enough. It was still a little bit grainy, but because I'm cooking it here, I don't think it's going to matter. So I'm just going to scrape that out. And then there's the beans. Fuck's sake. Dropping everything. And there's the beans and the beef mash. in and stir it up and break up the bean mash. And again this instruction specifically say um, season with salt and pepper, stir and bring to the boil. Once well, boiling reduce heat. And you can see the tomato bits already boiling but I just want to uh, get the beans through it before I lower the heat. Because adding anything to a hot pan cools it down. So a bit of seasoning, knocking. See, there's the salt. There's the pepper. And there's one last uh, And like I say, I've been the bean mash I've now broken up to go through it. Um, and again, now we're waiting for it to boil. So I'll stop stirring while that's happening. that's bubbling so now I turn the heat right down to the uh, lowest level on this on this hob and that now leaves and now my timer says 15 minutes and 10 seconds so 12 minutes so uh, 10 minutes would be five minutes 12 minutes would be three minutes um, but but that remember the uh, wedges were 20 to 25. So by the time it gets to 20, 20, so by the time it gets down to five minutes, that'll have been at the 20, which is the minimum. And by the time it gets to three to uh, three minutes, it'll have been 22, which will probably be about right. So it doesn't, so everything is going to be done at the same time, which is again why I didn't try to do any chopping things between, because otherwise this would be much done much later than the wedges. Anyway, now that just needs to stay. Um, with being given a poke and a stir occasionally. So now I've just got a large pile of washing up to do, which since I've got um, 12 minutes, I'm gonna do. Uh, but I will note, I'm down to 14 minutes. And again, if I'm gonna take this thing out in another 10 minutes, uh, that means it's already been in for 10 minutes. 
So I'm going to turn my wedges as well. I'm going to give them a turn. And they're starting to brown nicely. Right, so I'm going to um, go over to the sink with all of these items and bring you across as well. Given the amount of washing up, I won't get it all done in the 12 minutes. But I'm going to give it a good go. Because this is uh, handy to have as much of it as possible. So again, when I, when I come to tomorrow, I don't have so much washing up. Here we're just tracking backwards and forwards. But anyway, that's what that looks like. And that will remain looking like that basically the entire time. So now we try here, what can you see? You can see into my sink, that's fine. It's not very interesting for you. Again, I think this is more like asthma with occasional clattering. Put all this stuff to wash up. So wash up the knife first to keep it nice. And also I've realized um, I've got a, like, a quite complicated electronic system for uh, I say quite complicated. I've got one of those um, heating systems where you can set it exactly. You use it, use the internet. You can set it for exactly when you want it to come on and off, and the heating's off. Um, but the hot water I've only got on for an hour a day, which is enough because it basically uh, the water stays after after an hour's worth of heating. The water stays hot for the rest of the day that I need it. But the time it's set to come between is six fifteen and seven fifteen, and it's now six o'clock. So. Um, we're at the point exactly of the day where it has the coldest water, which I say doesn't matter too much because there's still uh, some warm water that will come through, but it won't be as hot. And of course, because obviously when you use water, the tank fills itself up again. Um, so the more like so when I use the I wash up, wash my face in the mornings, um, that uses uses some of the hot water and then. Uh, fills it up with cool, so that cold water, which then uh, makes the entire tank cooler. But like I say, um, that generally does it for me. Also, it's um, it's a slightly annoying system because A, the first week that I lived here, I didn't have any internet, uh, which is fine, except um, the heat, central heating was the only system with internet, and you can't turn it off or on. Um, with, when there's no internet, which uh, wasn't great because it meant um, I could still shower because the shower's a power shower, but I otherwise didn't have hot water. I could flip the well, there's an emergency heater, so I could flip that on, um, but that was like a lot of a waste of power, and also like, you had to think in advance oh, in an hour's time, I'm going to want, um, want hot water. Not to boy a kettle. Um, so, that, what, so that's not great. And then also, obviously, if your internet goes out, it stays stuck on whatever the last setting was, um, and you can't change it. So it's either stuck off or stuck on. Again, it's not great. Um, like, like the fact that it'll turn itself off automatically, otherwise, like if it's working properly, uh, and it's not taking the sensor about. So I'm also going over now, because we've got 10 minutes to go. So I'm going to give things a quick stir, but I'm also going to turn on the other oven to heat my bowl. And yeah, give the other thing a big stir. Oh, and it smells so nice. All right. But uh, sorry, yes, talking about my central heating. So um, you can, uh, so you could, it it's, um, has a temperature sensor, which only has the one. You can, but obviously you can buy more instead of the same thing. I've just got the one and I carry it about the house um, if I need to. Uh, basically, it moves between the living room and my bedroom. Um, and it won't basically it'll stop heating once it reaches temperature, which is nice because it saves you power. At least it's not running when you don't need it to. Um, but it also and it also has a thing where you can set it for during the day, so you can make sure it's always on during the day when you're at the house um, and set it to be a slightly higher temperature just before bed or just before you get out of bed to warm things up in the morning. So that's all good. Um, but again, it also has a feature which I have turned off, uh, which lets it, um, it, it says like, oh, it'll, if you can sync it with your mobile phone, and then when it detects your phone near the house, it'll start to, re like, when, when your phone's not in the house, it'll turn itself off, um, and when it, de um, when it detects you coming near the house, it'll, um, it'll, it'll start heating up. It's like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. 
Yes, except it's a heating company, so their cyber security is not going to be great because um, unless you're a bank or somebody who absolutely has to have cyber security, and sometimes not even then, um, most tech companies, cyber security is not great, which means that anyone who hacked into it can see whether I was in the house or not. And that is a big no. So I just have a manual thing. Well, I mean, it's still not perfect, which is like, see if you hacked in, you could see I turned it off. You could still might know that might go well oh she's turned it off she's out of the house because i might also have turned it off because like say um it's not like, like i mean it's, it's off for good at the moment because it's like may and i turned my heating off in march anyway but um like it could be oh it could just be a warm day and she's turned it off because she can't bother or oh she turned it off because she meant to be out of the house um going to the theater but in the end she overslept and didn't go so you don't know that i'm not in the house because i've done it manually and i could have forgotten to turn it on or forgotten to turn it off um, and it did mean I spent a lot of time um, cut, like not, not this last year because I've not been going anywhere but uh, before that um, going like right well I'm going to the theatre on Tuesday and Wednesday so um, the, and that's why I'm obviously, sitting around, obviously not working from home it's like right so I leave for work at 8 o'clock in the morning so the heating can go off at 7.30 because it'll be warm enough, like the, the residual heat will keep it warm enough and then it doesn't need to come back on until I come back from work but I go straight from work to, or well not straight from, I like, would do either studying for my professional qualifications or just sitting and reading depending, um, between going to the, uh, going from work to the theatre, there's no point in coming home because it's um, basically it's a triangle so there's no uh, there's no, uh, uh, like, like I'd come home for five minutes and have to leave again. There's no point. I wouldn't even have time to change. There's no point. So I won't be back home until after the theatre. And I, like, after the theatre, I might also, because um, I'm an associate of the Theatre Royal, um, one of the benefits is you get to meet the cast if you go on opening nights, which is the main reason I do it. So I'll be like, so I'm going to go to the theatre, then I'm going to watch the play, and then after the play, I'm going to see the cast. So I'm not going to be back till half past eleven. So I only, and so I wanted to start up heating up the house again because it's been cold all day at eleven o'clock. And I was uh, having to do all these calculations to work it, and then and then having to adjust it every week because I go to the theatre on different days each week because I'd, I'd go depending on when opening night was, um, and then what other th what other things were on, and what other and what other um, what other things I was doing. And then other nights I'd be like, well, I'm coming straight back. Like, oh, I'm doing studying after work, um, so I'm not going to come home till late anyway. Because I'd, I'd study in the works cafeteria. Because, well, not cafeteria, it's a, it was a basically a, a, a quite a nice sort of sitting room area with tables and some, well, table and chairs and also some sofas, which was available to everybody in the building. So it was like a shared office building, um, but quite a small one. So it wasn't like a lot of people getting very dirty. There was hardly ever anybody in there. And in the evenings I'd go and sit there um, and, and do revision for my professional exams. Um, and so uh, that was, uh, so, I'd be, so I was like, well, I know they've locked the building at uh, nine o'clock and they'll kick me out. So um, that's when I need to, uh, that's when I, so I'll, but I'll stay there doing, doing revision till then. That means I'll get a lot of revision done. I had a very, oh that was a very tiring year. I've still got one professional exam to do. Part of the reason I've put up this long is because it was so tiring. Oh, I didn't need to wash this board. This is the fork I'm going to meet with. Um, it's because it was so tiring doing that for sort of yonks. But I've still got one more to do and another six months to it and I'll actually probably call it. All right, I'm just going to go and stir my uh, sauce again as well. Oh, and the barbecue smell. Let's just say that's and the amount of barbecue sauce I made is probably more than needs to be. But at the same time, um, I'd absolutely rather to clean this. By the way, I sort of just put a drop of uh, washing up liquid on it and then squeeze it and let the uh, suds get through it. But I'd, I'd, I'd rather have it be very barbecue than not. So and it smells very nice. And I think I'm not going to need to add any more salt and pepper, but I will give it a quick sniff at the end. And I have managed quite nicely I think to uh, that's also that's the basic thing that's going in recycling. Um, I'm going to just take the recycling out. Uh, 
I'm going to have a quick look at my timer because obviously um, well, my timer's on four minutes. So uh, everything is just about done. So I'm going to leave that tub because I mean, tubs always take longer than you think. You need to scrub into all of the corners, otherwise it doesn't uh, doesn't get them properly clean. But I will just clean this. So that means I've got the minimum amount of. Um, other washing up that I'll need doing. Obviously, there'll also be the uh, the tray that's currently got the uh, wedges on it, plus the pan and the uh, pokey things, plus the spoon for dishing, plus the serving spoon. So, uh, plus obviously my bowl. I'm going to take that out because the hot tray I'm going to go put in the uh, sink. I just need my own things right. So that is what that looks like now. You can see. And that's bubbling away and nice and thick. And we're on to three minutes now, so I'm going to take the heat off that. Um, and now you're pointing far too far downwards, so I need to hump you up a bit. Yep, there we go. That's it, that's it. The way that was just what I was using to prop up the. Uh... And the, yeah, the wedges. Looking at the wedges, the wedges are cooked. That's what I was using to prop up the camera. So, the wedges are cooked. Oven off, hold on. So. I need them off the hot hob. So, there's my juice, so. things to add and do. And over here as well. Right. So get my bowl out. Nice and warm. Get my wedges. Pull them into the bowl. You can see this is what done wedges look like then. Got brown bits and soft bits. will go into this bowl and half of it will go into that tub for it to be eaten and that can be microwaved so the only thing I'll need to roast tomorrow do tomorrow is to roast the wedge bits that can just be heated up in the microwave last minute and I'll just again I don't like tasting hot things but I'll just taste the back of this well that is actually quite sweet I'm gonna squeeze the pepper and a sprinkle of salt. I said that in the opposite of things to doing them, I didn't know the difference. And then you can stir with the spoon. I've put the wooden things, by the way, and put them on the plastic lid so that they don't drip everywhere. Um, and I haven't yet turned off the fan because obviously this is still letting off steam. So, spoon, spoon. Yeah, and again, I do a spoon, one spoon in each, because again, I'm very bad at judging hard, so there's no way I could take like three spoonfuls. What I do is I go, oh, this looks plenty, you do four spoonfuls, and then there's only one spoonful left for the other one. Lots of sauce, lots of sauce. Lots of sauce, lots of sauce. See, I'm scraping this out, and as I've mentioned before, because this pan's nice and new and oh, I forgot to turn it off. That will be the actual time. Yeah, because this pan's nice and new, um, I'm not going to stick it under a cold tap and, and put cold water in it because that damages the, uh, the stick. If you do that, right? So now I can turn the uh, turn the heating off. Right, turn this fan off. Right, and then these go into the uh, into the sink. I'll leave them to soak. Okay. 
and then I've got the things to add. So the cheese is going to go on first because it will melt onto the nice hot, uh, hot substance. So sprinkle, 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 sprinkle. And this is why I grated lots of cheese because again, because I'm bad at judging halves, this makes sure that there's enough cheese. Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. That goes in the fridge for tomorrow. And then I've also got the wedges to squeeze over and I'll squeeze them now. So squeeze, squeezy lime wedge. Um, squeezy lime wedge. That's quite a, that was a very juicy lime actually. Normally you, don't, you can't get that much juice out of a wedge. Anyway, that's the lime done. So I can go in the uh, bin. Then the uh, spring onions. Try to get a nice mixture of whites and uh, green bits. And again, I'm trying to take only half. And that's going to go in the fridge. And finally, my lime sour cream. Which I'll drizzle over. Drizzle around the sides. And my spoonful. That'll be just right. And then those three go in the fridge. The beef, barbecue beef, will go in the fridge, um, but not now. I want it to cool down first because otherwise the inside of the fridge heats up a bit. Um, it just makes your fridge work harder. It won't break it straight away, although it will, if you do it repeatedly, it will shorten the lifespan. Um, but uh, yes, so this is my meal. Um, and as always, I will let you know what I thought uh, after I've eaten it. So, bon appetit. So I finished my meal um, and it was very nice. Um, the barbecue sauce, it was a good strong barbecue flavour and it did taste nice, but it did get slightly overwhelming. And I think that is because when I made it up myself, I made more um, than was needed. So there was basically too much sauce to um, the potato wedges. Um, so they were not, not as sort of in evidence as they should be. And then the bits where I got a bite, which also had the sour cream and the, uh, the spring onions and the cheese, they were, they were very, very nice. And it was a good balance of flavors, but there was a lot where it was just barbecue. So while I was enjoying it by the end, I was a bit sick of the barbecue flavor. So I think again, if I did make it again, I'd want the sachet of barbecue sauce. Um, and I'd probably use less barbecue sauce than I did use, but still, um, Obviously, I don't know how big a sachet they were going to give me, but I think that would have been too small and there wouldn't have been enough barbecue flavour. Because like I say, I've had a similar one to this before with um, potatoes and that one wasn't particularly barbecuey. So like somewhere, there's probably a middle ground somewhere. Um, as that stands, that's probably, again, I probably wouldn't bother making the dish again for myself, um, but it's definitely a four star dish. So yes, that was uh, very tasty, very enjoyable, and I'm looking forward to eating it again tomorrow. So uh, thank you all and bye-bye.